Hello everyone, my name is Ben Eady and I'm the online media manager of ModernAnalyst.com, the premier online community for business analysts. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Agile Requirements Gathering Process to Avoid Com Common Data Problems. Today's featured speaker is Mark Marinelli from LavaStorm and the webinar will last approximately 60 minutes including the Q&A session. So make sure to submit your questions in advance using the questions feature in the webinar software. I'd also like to say thank you to LavaStorm for sponsoring this event and at this time I'd like to turn it over to Mark to get us started. All right, hello everybody. Thank you for joining and thanks again to Martin Analyst for setting this up. Today's webcast will be as a requirement gathering process to avoid common data problems. It's really going to be a treatment of some of the problems that we see vis-a-vis -vis data quality and the foundation that you need to perform effective analyses in your company and some techniques and uh, the right, really the right process of uh, the right combination of people, process, and technology to overcome these challenges in a, in a more agile manner than traditionally uh, companies have tried to combat them. So the agenda for this meeting here, uh, we've got, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the new challenges in data quality. Uh, data quality has been with us, data quality issues have been with us for a long time, um, but there are some more recent developments uh, that exacerbate them um, and make more people uh, impacted by them. So we'll talk a bit about that. Then I'll introduce this Agile Requirements Gathering process, talk a bit about um, the characteristics of such and how it enables people to um, be more effective in managing their data. Then there'll be a demonstration of LavaStorm's approach, a technology which is really purpose-built to facilitate this type of agile data management and analysis. And then we'll, we'll wrap it up, talk a bit more, uh, sort of round out the importance of the agile collaboration, um, or the collaboration that enables this agile approach between business and IT professionals. And in the end, we'll, uh, we'll leave some time, hopefully about 10 minutes or so, for some Q&A. So please, propose any questions that you have using the, uh, the webinar features now, uh, but I will save all of the Q&A to the end. So data quality errors, uh, they're, they're pervasive and they're substantial. So we'll start off here with, uh, with a sort of analyst view. Um, you've got some major folks here saying things like uh, poor data quality costs U.S. businesses at least 30% of revenues, uh, $700 billion per year of, uh, of things that can be avoided by having more control over the quality of, of data that drives the decisions that a business makes um, and the analyses that guide those decisions. Um, poor quality customer data costs U.S. business uh, up to 600 uh, over $600 billion a year um, in postage, printing, staff overhead. Uh, these are operational costs um, that really don't need to be incurred. Um, and then we've got Gartner here talking about the, the primary reason data quality being, or lack of data quality being a primary reason um, for 40% of business initiatives failing to achieve their targeted benefits. Um, so you're, you're basing a lot of your decisions, hopefully, uh, upon analyses of the different data that drive the different areas of your business. And if, uh, if you, you've got the classic garbage in, garbage out problem, um, which can lead to uh, suboptimal performance of any initiatives you undertake. And then overall, we're, we're saying here, uh, Gartner again, that uh, there's a 20% sort of drag on overall labor productivity uh, introduced by a lack of data quality. So that's, that's the market view of the problem we're talking about. Um, take it out of the, uh, the academic realm here and, and put a little bit uh, of substance behind it. Here's a, a couple of interesting um, examples of the impact of data quality issues um, that everybody sees. Um, there, there's, uh, if you remember a few years back, there was a, a rather large problem with the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average um, due to an M instead of a B million instead of a billion. You, you would think that the systems that drive this enormous portion of our economy um, would be sort of bulletproof and, and avoid these sorts of mistakes, um, but they don't. And you, you're looking at a trillion dollars, a trillion dollar error in, in 15 minutes um, due to a misclassification of, uh, of one of the numbers in those systems. 
Another uh, more recent and perhaps more controversial example is a, a study which was widely cited and really drove a lot of financial policy, especially in European countries, around austerity regimes that uh, was based upon a study that came out of, I believe it was Harvard University, um, where a couple of um, financial, or I'm sorry, economists had really built some models about the, uh, the, the threshold over which a particular government can be less effective uh, with some of their policies, as evidenced by the ratio, the relationship between their debt and uh, GDP. And as it turns out, uh, some people came back more recently and said, no, they're wrong. They, they got a few of their calculations wrong and a lot of the impact of, of what they were, um, uh, were forecasting people should do um, turned out to be erroneous as well. So a, a couple of examples of really major impact of data quality issues. So quant we've quantified the problem a little bit, given uh, a, a bit of um, a, a treatment of how it impacts people. Let's talk a little bit more about the qualities, uh, the criteria for avail uh, evaluating data quality. What is data quality? Um, data should be accurate. If, when you're looking at all of the data that you're analyzing, do the data represent reality uh, or verifiable source? Data should have integrity. Is the structure of the data and the relationships among the individual entities or attributes, is it maintained consistently uh, across systems? Every time I see a particular item in the data, does it look the same? Um, consistency, are the data elements consistently defined and understood? Does a particular social security number look the, the same in multiple different systems, or is it rendered differently, um, and, and are they logically the same? Uh, completeness, Should I, do I have all of the data that I need, or are there, are there holes in the data which are going to lead to erroneous judgment, or are there more data that I could acquire that will lead to a more comprehensive picture of whatever it is that I'm, I'm trying to analyze and, and inform better decisions. Validity, this is pretty important. Um, the data fall within acceptable ranges. Are there outliers in the data population that really shouldn't exist that lead me to question the data entry, uh, the data at its entry point? Timeliness, do I have all of the data, not do it just do I have all the data do I, that I need, but do I have it in the interval in which I can take action upon it? Um, or are there latencies among data collection or presentation platforms that introduce their own potential for error? Because uh, in the time that it took me to collect data about, say, a billing system, where the order that was placed today will not be manifested in that billing system because they, they just haven't uh, propagated amongst those systems. I don't want to erroneously believe that that order is never going to get into the billing system. So I have to uh, accommodate timeliness of data collection. And accessibility. If, if I had, if all of these things are true about my data, that it is consistent and complete, can I even get at the data? Um, it, it, can it be rendered to me as an analyst in a format that I can understand? If it's, uh, if it's all a curated, wonderful data set, um, but I can't make use of it, then uh, all of the other stuff doesn't really matter. So it sounds pretty simple uh, to have all of these things, and it sounds pretty uh, intuitive that any business would have uh, complete control over data quality. But if you, if you look here at all of the different forces at work, um, any company is going to have a variety of systems that drive their business. And these are siloed systems. They often have different owners. They grew up organically. There was never an integration plan from the beginning. So you have have duplicate data among different data sets, you have inconsistent data, you've got inaccurate data because the people who are sometimes human beings are entering these data and, um, and they're, they're bad to begin with. Um, but there's an awful lot of aspects to the way that data are acquired and stored and communicated among systems that are going to introduce all manner of error and really break all of the, uh, the tenants that we talked about in the previous slide. This isn't a new issue. We've been dealing with data quality issues since computers started storing data and people started trying to make use of those data. Um, but why are we talking about it now? Why is this more of a problem now? Um, 
the real driver here is that beyond your traditional analytics where you had a, maybe a centralized data warehouse and a centralized business intelligence infrastructure and were performing analyses just on those data, these days we see an expansion. There's a lot of, under the rubric of big data analytics, you see more types of data. Um, you see things that are unstructured data that are, are not going to be sitting in the, within the control or the purview of the IT department that may curate your traditional analytics data set. Uh, things like unstructured data, um, they're, they're either imperfectly uh, warehoused or not warehoused at all. You've got data that are outside of your business. You've got data up in the cloud that you want to, I want to look at my Salesforce data to round out my analysis for my, uh, say, my billing or my customer environment. Um, my, my IT brokers are not, data brokers are not going to warehouse that for me. It's up in the cloud. There's a reason it's up in the cloud, but I still need to be able to get at it. Um, there's more use of third-party data, public data that are available through uh, web interfaces, these massive online databases that are now available to people and, and provide a much richer data set. Again, they're, they're not something that I want my own copy of or my business wants its own copy of, but I still really want to be able to get at those data. So there's, there's a larger system of data uh, or a larger ecosystem of data systems that we want to acquire data from. Um, and at the same time, there are more people who want to be able to build their business or run their business based around analyses of all of these data sets. So you have, uh, you have less control over the structure and the cleanliness of that data, and you have more people who want to have access to it. Uh, so the, these, are, these are vectors that are producing uh, more, more issues and uh, more tangible impact to companies than heretofore has, uh, has been an issue. So we talked about the problem at large and, and why it's different. Uh, I'll just give a, a, an example, a real example here to uh, make it a bit more tangible. Where, where does data cleanliness fall apart? Um, understanding the data is data integrity. When two people are looking at a particular data set, and this is traditionally going to be someone in, a, in an IT department who is building data warehouses, who's presenting data for the business users, and the business users themselves who want to make use of these data and uh, build their analyses, uh, influence their decisions. When these two people look at the same data set, they may see different things. When I see in a database or in a spreadsheet that the field CNUM is equal to 617-354-5422. Um, as, a, as a casual observer of the data or maybe even somebody who uh, knows, the, the data, knows about databases but doesn't know about our business data, that can have multiple different interpretations to me. Is it, is it a customer identification number? Um, if I look at it one way, it, it could be a cellular phone number uh, without any formatting. It could be a count of all of the contracts that I have, and, or it could be a financial amount. It could be a, a capital expense amount. So it can be a whole bunch of different things, and, and oftentimes there's not enough knowledge implicit in the way that the data is stored or the metadata about it that drive that information. You can get a lot from the context, um, but, but sometimes it's, it's uh, still left vague. Let's say we do understand it and we know from whatever documentation we have for the data source or maybe we've got a really great metadata management system, we know exactly what that thing is. Um, what happens when the six is dropped from the front of it or the two is dropped from the end of it? How does that, that, that radically alters um, a financial amounts that you've seen up top? Um, it, hopefully is going to break something somewhere in the database. Hopefully there's some control there that says that this has to be a 10 character field or it has to be in a certain format, um, but oftentimes there isn't. So if, if the data meaning is in the eye of the beholder and then the data are invalid for whatever reason upstream causes this number to be invalidated, how, how do you catch it? Um, and how can a, a IT user who may be really, uh, as again, uh, good with databases but not know an awful lot about how these data are used upstream, how are they going to know that this is a problem? So the data quality 
really comes down, when, you, when you're going to use these data, it comes down to getting the right data requirements. And it comes down to getting those right data requirements from the business users who are closest to the way that the decisions that are made based upon these data, the way that these data are used in their day-to-day -day operations. Should be easy. You just get the two of them together and, um, and they'll, they'll figure it out. But it's not. Uh, there's an operational reality here uh, where there's really three main issues that lead to inefficiency in the communication of what the data mean and thus the correction of any problems that are introduced from dirty data. One is ownership. Um, traditionally, in the business, as I was saying before, there's a sort of centralized IT function. The onus is upon them to maintain data quality. But Oftentimes, data quality to them may mean that the, that the fields aren't empty. It, they may not be able to catch some of the errors that I mentioned before because they lack the subject matter expertise to recognize them. Optimally, decision makers should have some ownership of the data which inform their decisions. Um, so the business, out at the, at the end of the spokes of the business, not in the, the centralized data infrastructure, those business users need to have to share ownership. And oftentimes that's not the case. They're just consumers of outputs from a, from a centralized repository. There's this gulf of understanding, um, the disconnect between the, the business owner and the data owner, uh, the data owner really having more ownership and the business owner just, just trying to make some use of what they're getting. Um, this, this understanding gap can be pretty massive and it can be difficult to close because they speak different languages. They, uh, the IT guys speak SQL, the business guys speak English. Um, they use different tools. They're, they're, uh, the IT may be using database technologies and, and sophisticated data analyses, um, whereas the business user is often going to be using something like Excel or, or you know, spreadsheets or maybe a desktop visualization tool, uh, but they're not really using a combined tool set. And they have different priorities. The, the business wants to get things done as quickly as possible and get all the data that they need to make that happen. The IT folks want to make sure that nobody's off making the wrong decisions based upon bad data, so they want to have a bit more control over um, the data. That leads to our third point, that the control is it's difficult. It can, the more control you place around the data at the entry point, the more control you place around the accessibility of those data, the less likely there are going to be problems because you've, you've got um, at least one authority who is trying to meter any access to the data and make sure that each field is, is available and, and curated and all of the things that we talked about before. Um, but that takes time, and it takes money, and it often lags behind the business. Uh, um, converse from the, uh, the IT folks who want to make sure that everybody's working off the, the same sheet of music, the business folks don't want to be held back by waiting for the IT folks to make sure that all of the data that they need is warehoused and cleansed. They want to be able to just go find, solve problems using the, maybe the spreadsheets that they've got on their desks or something that they've got out in the cloud. Um, so as much as you want to put rules in place in the source systems to stop data issues from arising, uh, those rules are going to be broken and you can't let those rules uh, hold back the business. So new rules are going to be needed to be implemented very quickly as the business wants to make more and different use of the data sources available to them. So you're really left with two choices. Um, if, if you're out trying to make data-driven decisions, you can wait for that curated, centralized data set to adequate, adequately reflect your requirements. Um, and in the interim, it's going to pre be producing potentially dirty data, and you're going to make bad decisions. Um, and you're just going to do your best efforts to work around the infirmities of that centralized data repository, uh, the, the data quality issues or, or the um, lack of curation of some of the data that you need. Or you can adopt a new, more agile approach and implement some of the data quality validations and data hygiene uh, yourself in collaboration with the brokers of the data and build that analytical foundation that you need. Um, knowing that later on uh, at, we have, we'll be able to 
implement a lot of the things that we've done in an agile fashion back into that centralized repository. Um, but we're not going to let us slow that down, uh, let that slow us down. So we're obviously advocating uh, in this webinar and as a company for the second choice. So the agile requirement gathering approach, how does this contrast to the traditional one and, and how do we address those three major areas that I mentioned as being problems? Agile requirement gathering is fundamentally predicated on decentralization. The IT department is going to need to cede some of the control over their data sets um, by providing the business users with the tools and the access to the data that they need and letting them work with greater self-sufficiency. That takes trust. Um, if, if you're going to allow uh, a bunch of people who are not trained in IT practice to work with data sets and start making decisions in the business based upon their analyses of those data, you have to be able to trust that they're going to do the right thing, that they're going to adopt some of those practices that you use to try to ensure that the data are accurate and, uh, and whole. Um, so in order to do that, you need to give them tools that are going to allow them to do that, and you need to collaborate with them. Um, that you need to really, on the understanding side and, and the collaboration side, you, you need to just break down the traditional waterfall approach, uh, the, the, as some would call it, where a, if we're going to stand up, say, a new analytics project and stand up a, a new, some new BI infrastructure, we're going to hold a series of meetings, we're going to write a bunch of requirements documents, and we're going to have more meetings to uh, re review the requirements, we're going to go off and, and code something in, in the uh, centralized repository if you can cost justify that we can do it in the first place. We'll give you some results. You'll say that the results were not quite there because only having seen those results do you realize you needed to give me three or four more business rules. Um, that, that's the traditional approach. Rinse, repeat, it takes a long time. It's a protracted approach. We need to replace that with a more data-centric conversation, optimally a live, uh, in-person conversation with the data between the IT department and the business users where they can, using the data right in front of them, apply business rules to the system data and ensure that all of the proper requirements are met. In order to do that, as I said, you need tools. So. If you are working with a unified tool set that can match both of those skill sets, the, the IT developer being more technically savvy but knowing less about the, the business use application of the data and the business user being less technically savvy but knowing a lot more about that, if you can use the same tool that, that, that both of them can use to collaborate. Um, that can incorporate all of the different sources of knowledge that provide the traceability that everyone's going to want after they've worked with the data for a while and, and made a decision or suggesting a decision, you want to be able to trace back to those data and make sure that the data that uh, inform that decision are have the integrity and, and are uh, of quality. Um, and something that both of these actors can modify as the business rules change and the data change, which we know is going to happen, you want to be able to modify your requirements and the implementation of those requirements quickly but doing all of this in a responsible fashion because you're still maintaining all of the necessary data quality controls that a traditional infrastructure and process would provide. So that's, that's sort of um, an, an academic approach. Practically, what does this mean? What does an agile requirement gathering approach look like? Um, I've got here uh, some little uh, conversation points between the IT and business user uh, addressing some of the points that I mentioned earlier of uh, the aspects of good data quality. On the accuracy side, you can be looking at two different data sources and you see Joe Smith in both of them and he's got two totally different social security numbers. Um, how am I going to know? How is the, the IT person going to know? What's really the system of record here? Which one of these do I use? The business user can say, Trust me, it's, it's the billing system on, on the right. The, uh, the CRM data needs a bath. It, it's dirty. We did a migration a while back. We used this weird third-party source, and a lot of the holes that we had in Social Security numbers were just filled in with, uh, with garbage. 
don't look there. Look over in the billing system, and um, we'll, we'll collect those or collate those two data sets and come up with something that's better. The integrity side, um, you can see, again, I see Joe Smith in, in two different systems, or I see Joe, two records for Joe Smith in the same system, and his date of birth is, uh, is off by a year. Um, I think these two are the same guy, but, but they don't match. And then the business user can say, well, yeah, let's, let's try a pro, uh, some fuzzy matching and see what the other aspects we have of these two records are. And uh, whereas the, a discrete match wouldn't have given us a match because it's off by a year, a fuzzy match will allow us to see, will to, to take these exceptions uh, from the matching criteria as a separate source and, um, and see what we can do with them. Maybe some of them are actually not matches, but at least we need to be able to isolate them and incorporate them back into the main data set as necessary. Consistency, I see, again, our, our friend Joe Smith here. He's got two different systems. Uh, that's obviously the same customer ID, but it's rendered two different ways in two different systems. Um, so in order to get those in the same format in the, the centralized data warehouse where this came from, you're going to hear maybe it's going to take a long time to get all of those customer IDs that were hand entered in that field into the same format across all of our databases. With the right approach, with an agile approach, with the right tools and, and having this conversation, the business analyst can say, well, fine, let, let's just for now implement some controls here and, and fix the data with the set that we're working on and then we'll worry about the warehouse later. Um, but we're not going to let waiting in line to get in that data warehouse stop us from being able to solve the problem at hand. So this conversation there can, continues with completeness, validity, timeliness, accessibility, or any other aspect of data quality. Um, this is the type of conversation that you should be having, not a sequence of meetings and emails and requirements documents. You should be looking at the data and, and having an informed conversation. So now I want to animate this a little bit by showing a software approach that, as I said up front, is really purpose-built to solve this problem, to broker that conversation. I'm going to switch over, and uh, now you see on my screen the LavaStorm Analytics Engine. This is our platform for data management and analysis that you can see provides a, a pretty visual way for someone to construct an analytical application. That's what you see here. Um, and uh, as, I, as I walk you through it, you'll see that it really does foster a data-driven conversation. Very quickly, to acclimate you to what you're looking at, uh, the LavaStorm Analytics Engine is a, it's an analytical application development environment. It's really targeted towards a business user, although a, an IT pro or a software developer is going to have a lot of fun with it too, but we're making sure that uh, the, the business user part of this conversation can be hands on the keyboard as well. You're building your applications you, by uh, the drag and drop assembly of these little individual nodes here. When you can, you see that uh, they've got nodes connected here, and coming out of each one of these nodes is a data set. So I'm actually working live with the data. In this particular application, it's a very simplified application for the purposes of demonstration. I'm solving a, a classical X to Y data problem. In this case, it's a telecommunications problem, where I've got two data sources that should agree upon a bunch of things, and they don't. And I want to find out where, where they disagree and why. In this case, uh, I've got a bunch of customers who are uh, consuming telecommunications services from me. They've got cell phones. They've got all these plans on their cell phones. And I've got them out sitting in my telecommunications network. I've turned them on. They're, they're using these services. Hopefully, I've got a billing record for all of them. But where I want to find out where I don't and the conditions under which I don't so that I can do the root cause analysis, go back and fix it. The important thing here is if I'm going to solve this problem, and you see here this is sort of the, the final baked application, I want to make sure that by the time I publish out these results for someone to take action upon them, uh, in this case it is an unbilled customer that I want you to go and start billing or find out why they're not billed, I want to make sure that I'm giving people accurate data. In order to do that, I need to make sure that way upstream here on the left, all of the data sources that I've acquired through this tool conform to the types of data quality measures that we, we've talked about here before. 
I'm going to, I've, I've built this application, you'll see me do a little bit more of it, but I'll, I'll just quickly run through the, the types of these little nodes that you see on the screen. I'm cycling through the palette on the bottom here, and um, there, there are different nodes for acquiring data, for transforming data, that's changing fields or filtering the data. Uh, we've got interfaces to external systems. Um, we've got some working with the metadata. Um, important here, and I'll about to show you an example, is profiling and patterns. That's really germane to the sort of data cleanliness hygiene exercise that is a necessary prerequisite for good data analysis, accurate data analysis. I've, uh, I've acquired my billing data and my network data for this problem. The first thing that I want to do, now imagine that I'm a, uh, a business user and I'm sitting down next to the IT broker who owns this billing system, who has given me the extract or the access to the billing system that's given me this small set of 12,000 records. He's pretty confident that all the data are there. We need to have a conversation. So the first thing I'm going to do is, is profile the source data. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drill in here, and you're going to see a bunch of these nodes here. Each one of them is keyed off the, the 12,000 billing records that I've got here. Um, I'm going to run, in, in our technology here, I'm going to run the, the data analyzer. I'll, I'll rerun it right now. And this is now going to take those input data, and it's going to inspect the input data for, and show me some of the patterns in the data. It's going to show me what fields are there, what are the field types, et cetera pull that output up right now and I see, all right, this looks right to me. There's, there's nothing missing here. I think these are enough data for us to go on. Um, this all looks right. These are the right data types. Um, I, don't, I don't see anything here that, uh, that stands out as being an issue. So that's good. That, that's our first requirement is making sure that we have all the fields necessary from the uh, requisite data sources. Second thing I want to do though is uh, if I look at the data and I, I sort them, we're going to see that there is a, uh, there's a row ID somewhere in here. And I want to make sure, well, do I have all of the data? Are those uh, the 12,000 some odd records that I have here, are they, um, I've, I've sequenced them here, or are there any missing records? So here we'll use our, our interval inspection node here, which I've already drag and drop on the canvas. So I'll, I'll re-execute that. And this is going to look for gaps. So if I look at that, I see, yeah, sure enough, between rows 8,602 and 9,001, there is a gap. There's, there's no data there. Um, why? Is that because there is, uh, there's a whole bunch of different reasons why that could be. Some of them are benign. It could be, well, we, we re-indexed the database in the, da in the billing system, and it just started off with that record ID. Don't worry about the record ID. It's just there for reference. Uh, but more and more sinister thing could be that uh, there was a system outage and a whole bunch of those records got dropped as the extract that I've given you was prepared. I want to at least know that that gap exists so I can ask the right question. And if necessary, if it's, if it's the latter problem, then let's go back and get that missing data or recreate the data set. If it's the former, all right, fine, we'll, we'll move on. I want to look for duplicates in the data. I want to look to see is, is the data set that I just pulled right now of these 12,000 records, I've done this 12 times before, um, is it around the same number of records? So if I, if I look at the previous data extracts and see that uh, I've got two different sources here, here's when the data were pulled, these were the number of records that came out. If I compare that to mine right now, I'm going to see that in some cases, no, it's, uh, it's, it's, in some cases it's fine. Yep, there's 239 records here. On average, there's 243. Um, but in other cases, this is off by more than the tolerance that I set. I set a 10% tolerance, and this is off by more than that. So maybe, again, we should go back and look and see if there's something that we're missing from the data that may not have been covered by my, my missing record search. Um, because it, it's uh, not manifested in the, in the row IDs, but some other way we're going to find that there's, um, there's some missing data. So that's that, that preliminary step where we're just sort of in a, in a pretty automated, pretty easy fashion, looking at the data with a little bit of understanding from the business of the, what those data mean, um, but mainly we're just kind of looking at patterns in the data. 
when we, when we move through the data preparation step, and we're going to get to the point where we're going to compare these two data sets, and uh, in this case, if, if you can see here, it's pretty small, I, um, I'm going to end up with, uh, and it downstream here before I publish this out, I'm, I'm, I'm going to end up telling the business that 131 of these customers from my, uh, from my set of 1,000 that originally came out of my network, 131 of those I don't have any billing information for. Previously in the conversation, um, we've, we've worked together, the IIT fellow and myself, we've worked together and we've identified some circumstances under which these people would never be in the billing system anyway. Um, in this case, we've got uh, a voicemail system, and that is billed somewhere else, so let's move that, they'll pull them out of the population. We have internal lines, we're the telecom telecommunications provider ourselves, and we've got a field force that has all these internal lines. We don't bill ourselves for that, so they're not going to be in there. So we've already done a couple of business-driven data um, integrity checks here to remove from the original set of 1,000 records to remove about 400 records that really shouldn't be included in this particular analysis. And that's why we have 131 errors here versus you know, maybe 400 errors, uh, a lot of which would have been ghosts and false positives. Um, but it doesn't end there. We want to be able to continually look at the data and see if there's anything else that we need to change in the data set. So if I look at the data right now, I'll give a couple of examples. Uh, we, we're, we're by being able to inspect the data live here, uh, rather than only see the output data after I've given someone my requirements and they've gone and built me something, I can really quickly and, and really agilely change my business rules if they are erroneous. Um, in this case, if you look at record nine here, um, we've got a, a bunch of nulls here. Um, I think the IT fellow is gonna say, I, I'm not sure if that is something down in, in the depths of our database that introduced those nulls, or whether they really should be nulls. So at least let's set them aside uh, as a data set. So it's pretty easy for us to, um, to go back in here, and uh, now I've, I've plunked my new node down there. I hook that up to the data, and I'm going to re-execute it, again live, working off the interim data sets here. And uh, all right, there's, there's 77 in there where that, that market field was null, among others. Uh, there's 530 where it wasn't. And I'm just going to bucket those somewhere and look at them later. For now, let's, let's ignore them and, and move on. Is there anything else that we see in the data that are anomalous or really we need to change things? Um, and the first thing that, uh, that the, the business user may say is this should only ever be the in-service status here. Uh, these guys that are in jeopardy, pending, that, that we shouldn't be looking at that at all. It's going to pollute our data set, um, and, and we need a whole different set of business rules to find out why they're not being billed. So let's get them out of there. Um, so again, it's pretty easy for me to look at the data, create one of these nodes here, hook it up to now my, my changed interim data set, execute that, and now I'm working off yet a smaller set. So, so live here, having this conversation, which is informed by the data, not by someone's interpretation of business rules, but the, by the actual data that are running through the systems, we've been able to add a couple more business rules. I'm now going to use this line of, uh, of business rules instead and, and rerun everything else downstream. And we're going to see that we're going to end up with um, entirely different results. In this case, um, per our uh, conversation, more accurate results. We're going to not be sending someone 131 errors that they need to fix. This is going to drop down to two errors um, by the time this, uh, this is finished. So I'm giving you an example here of the types of technologies, the type of methodology, the type of approach that can foster the type of conversation uh, that I've been talking about up until now. And we can do more and more and more of this and increasingly become confident that the business rules that we're applying to the data, the requirements that we've gathered are the right ones. In the end, we're going to end up with an application like the one that you see here, which is really going to emulate all of the business rules attendant to the, the billing process in, in our business. And that's great because that's how things should run, 
but more but very importantly we're going to be applying them to all of the data from the process and in a correct version of the data because the data are what's really happening and any variance between our implementation of the business rules and the actual system data that's something we need to look at those are exception cases let's go fix it so I'm going to go back to the uh, to the main deck now that I've shown you a little bit of demonstration hopefully uh, put a little meat on the bone for uh, what we're talking about in the this Azure requirements gathering, um, and really just uh, reiterate the importance here of this agile collaboration between business users and IT. Um, organizations that have, have really embraced this approach will take a holistic approach. It, this is a, a, an approach that's not technology alone, it's not going to solve it, and changing out people or, or getting more experts in there isn't going to solve it. It's really a combination of the right people, getting the right people talking, a repeatable process, a methodology where they're, they're getting together on a more frequent basis. They're, they're having these conversations, I say, informed by the data, and the appropriate technology. Uh, we could have a similar conversation to the one that I just showed you, but if we're still speaking SQL and Word documents, instead of using a, a collaborative visual technology where we're going to be limited in our ability to do this quickly and efficiently. The Agile approach, it's really predicated, as I said before, upon decentralization around moving or really trusting the edges of the business, the, the, the actual business users who are impacted by the quality of their data and the quality of their analyses to take some of the ownership of the data analysis and giving them the tools so that they can implement their own analyses, um, but being able to trust that they ha also have the tools to control their data sets and not introduce their own level of data quality problems because they, they're just not um, well equipped to do the types of um, data quality checks that I, I've shown you. Again, all of this really does require trust. It, it requires trust and experimentation to allow that, that first set of business users to, when equipped with these tools, um, to go and start being more self-sufficient. Um, it's still in collaboration with uh, IT, but they're, they're really going to be off doing a lot of things that um, they would have been more monitored on before. So you need to trust them. Um, that, that trust comes from the agility of the analysis, their ability to be more self-sufficient, to do a lot of these things themselves and place less of a support burden upon the already strained uh, IT infrastructure that's usually providing that support um, so that they can do things more quickly, but also the accuracy of their results. If, if they're doing it agilely and they're using more data and they're putting in better controls because they have a better knowledge of the data, they're going to come out, as we've just shown, with more accurate results. That, in turn, is going to engender more trust, which is going to engender more decentralization, et cetera. So said another way, there, there's really, if done properly, if you adopt an agile requirements gathering methodology and you equip everyone to do it, there's really a virtuous cycle um, that that just gets better and better of, of agility, accuracy, and trust. The, the trust is really, uh, it's, it, that's where we start. We say that the IT departments and the business users, um, I mean, we'd like to think that they all trust each other right now, um, but I think anybody who's, who's worked in either of those departments realizes that there's, um, there's some friction there between, as I said before, priorities and, and skill levels and, and responsibility. Um, let, let's engender more of that responsibility, I'm sorry, more of that collaboration, um, and that will lead to the collaboration really undergirds all of the agility that we talked about, the ability to really quickly acquire and work with data sets to really quickly make decisions upon those data sets to make analytics more pervasive in the business. If you've got a whole bunch of different small projects that are doing the, the types of analyses that they want to do on their own data sets and they don't need to wait for someone to present the data for them, um, you're going to solve more problems. There, there's going to be, uh, there's some obvious problems that the company is going to solve and will just, it's a no-brainer for them to stand up a data warehouse with all the relevant data and to build all the applications and BI infrastructure. But there's a lot of non-obvious problems 
uh, that are happening out in the field that you want to encourage the business user users to tackle, not anecdotally, but holistically using a, a data-driven analysis. That breeds more accuracy because they are um, taking a more comprehensive uh, yet still uh, a quality approach that breeds more trust that breeds more agility etc cetera, etc cetera. this this really becomes um, an engine for business improvement if you've got the right uh, if you've got the right agile approach So in, in summary, we're, we're, we're LavaStorm here. We're, we're LavaStorm Analytics presenting this. We, we've got software, as you've seen, uh, where we're trying to make business analyst heroes. We're, we're trying to really cater to the, the business analyst who wants to be able to perform these types of analyses in an agile fashion in collaboration with their IT department with all of the controls and, and rigor that they would expect from a traditional set. Um, and. Uh, I've just got some contact information up here, but at this point, I'm going to, uh, to stop talking and look for some questions from the audience on the material that I've covered so far. So one question here is, um, does the LavaStorm engine provide tools that will show data quality errors automatically? without having to see them or know about them first. Uh, definitely, and, and uh, I think, um, I, think I'll, yeah, I can pull us uh, back into the software here for a second and, and show you what I did before. The, these nodes here, um, you know, I'll, uh, I, I showed you the finished product, but I'll just show you doing it right now. There's, there's no magic here. I've, I've dragged my interval inspection node here, and uh, I'm going to look for a particular, uh, that record ID that we saw, remember we can always look at the data and see which uh, field we needed, and I'm going to say in here there should be no more than one, the number one uh, between any individual record ID there. And when I run this guy, I'm going to, oops, let's see what I've done wrong. Ah. I need to uh, convert that. I got a data quality issue. I needed to um, convert it to an integer in order for me to look at the sequence. So here we go. Just what I showed you before. There's that gap in the data. Next question. How do quality issues identified through the business rules get corrected? Can they be corrected automatically, or is a user interface provided that helps make these changes? That's a really great question. Um, I'm showing you how we make sure that we have the right data set, that we build all of our analyses upon which we're going to take actions, that we build them upon a solid, trustworthy foundation. But I'm not really talking much about what we're going to do about it. Um, and this really does speak to the, the practice of any business. Um, in our experience at LavaStorm Analytics, uh, we have we have a, a software technology that we provide ourselves that does the sort of case management, root cause analysis, that when I tell someone that there's a whole bunch of people that are not being billed properly, for my earlier example, you're going to be able to go and research why that was the case. Um, I'll, I'll provide you enough of the data in that result set to say, well, the overwhelming majority of these unbilled users have uh, their orders were processed last Tuesday. That's um, that tells me that there's something wrong with our order management system. It's a very different story than if I presented the data and said that all of the orders for these customers that were not billing um, they were produced by uh, Joe Smith. Um, well, Joe Smith needs to be trained how to use our ordering system properly because otherwise we're going to end up with uh, bad records which are going to introduce issues. Now, we will then take whatever we found out from that root cause analysis and feed it back into that analysis as, as another set of requirements um, and another set of business rules. So the next time we run this analysis, which we want to be a continuous process, we're not going to see those those same errors. and we'll implement all the operational changes that are necessary to fix it. Now that's that's a lava storm only story, but there's plenty of organizations we've worked with where they already have some sort of incumbent tool to manage the defects that any analysis tool would uh, present. We'll, we'll just 
push them out there. But at least they will know when they're coming out of the, the lava storm software and, and the methodology that we've employed that the data they're getting are trustworthy, that it's going to have a modicum of false positives, if any at all, and uh, that it's a trusted data set. Another question here, does the input need to be an Excel sheet? No, no, no. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pop right back into the software again here. Excel sheets, uh, Excel's pretty popular. A lot of, an awful lot of a lot of businesses is driven by Excel spreadsheets. There may be the, the big, interesting industrial databases and warehouses uh, that drive the big operations, the, the billing or the order management or your customer database. Um, but so much of the information that actually boots on the ground, drives decisions, is in Excel spreadsheets on, on people's desks all over the place. So I mentioned, I, I showed you some Excel spreadsheets here because that's common. Um, but our set of uh, data acquisition tools, which I'm, I'm showing you here now, this, this set of nodes, this can be, a, uh, it could be an Excel spreadsheet, it could be any sort of flat file, um, not necessarily from Excel, but just a, a flat file, a tab delimited file or something. It can be direct pull out of a database, that is often the case. Um, and it could be something uh, really arcane, like a, an old mainframe data file that only speaks COBOL. We can get at all of those data sources, and importantly, in the same application as you're seeing here, we can get at all of them, a mix of all of them, and homogenize the data set. We, we really want to be, if we're going to be agile and we're going to be able to just work with whatever data are available to us, we need to be able to get at the data in whatever form they're, they're being provided. Oftentimes, you, you have to wait a long time to get in line uh, in someone's data warehouse to get the table you need from the system you need in the format that you need, but they're already providing some sort of extract to somebody else for some other reason. Well, just repurpose that. Again, put in the data checks that you need to make sure that you're getting the right fields in the right formats and that all of the data are accurate. Got one more question here. How much of these errors that can, that can occur in the data can be mitigated by capturing the business requirements correctly in the first place? And how can your analytics software support this part of the process? Um, absolutely, this that that's optimally what should be happening, right? Is and if that were happening, uh, honestly, we wouldn't be in business. Um, there are. All of the requirements should be captured in as the systems are designed. That just doesn't happen. As I said way up front, the, the systems, they grow organically. Sometimes they're repurposed from other systems, and they don't have the necessary validations in them to drive some of the business rules. Um, but the, the good news is that when you use software like ours or use an approach like ours, you may be dealing with data that are coming from systems that don't have those, um, those requirements implemented, that don't have those validations implemented, and are producing imperfect data sets. So you have to emulate those validations yourself, as, as we've, you've seen me do here. Um, but you've captured all the business rules in this application, and when it comes time, hopefully sooner than later, to then incorporate those validations back into those systems, you know what they look like. So your, your you're at the vanguard now. You're working with data sets where you're going to have to do some of this yourself, but you're also helping the business identify the infirmities in the source systems and giving them the information necessary to make those validations. And that's how you know, for, for the earlier question about how do I correct this, that's how you know if things are getting better. When, when your billing department, I'm, I'm really picking on the, the billing and IT guys today, sorry, but when your billing department goes back and implements a check that says, uh, I'm not going to allow you to enter a null in some field, the next time I run this analysis, I'm not going to see that. This 77 goes down to none. All right, I fixed it. Great, move on. Um, so you, you just don't want to be beholden to someone else's timetable, uh, because these are often expensive infrastructure projects. You don't want to be beholden to somebody else's timetable on, on getting these data curated. Um, even though, yeah, it would have been great to, to know that up front. I've got, uh, got one more question. Do I need to replace my other solutions? Absolutely not. Um, we, our software, uh, you, you certainly are going to want to replace your existing processes. 
um, if you're if you're working in that sort of waterfall approach. And you're definitely going to want to get some tools that make the data available to you to have that data-driven conversation. Um, in our it, in our practical experience, oftentimes we're just a piece of the puzzle that you're maybe using our software to do all of this back end work on the acquisition and the and the, the preparation and the requirements gathering. Um, but you're publishing up someone else is going to make use of the data in say a, a click view and tableau outputs highlighted here. Um, if you've already got those and that's how you want a set of your users to interact with with the data set that I've produced for them in our technology, great. Uh, that, that We don't want to displace some of the tools that your users are productively using. What we want to do is make sure that the data that they're using in those tools are solid, are good, uh, you know, have all of the controls um, that, that are necessary to make sure that people aren't doing the, uh, the GIGO thing. So no, we're, we're not looking to um, displace all of the existing infrastructure that you have. We're just looking to facilitate a, a better way to manage those data and um, incorporate all of the, the business knowledge into the, the data sets. One more question. How long does it take to get up to speed to use the tool? The tool that we're looking at right here uh, depends on who you are. If you're a, an Excel user, and you're, you know your way around a pivot table, and maybe you've done a, a little bit of light uh, Excel expression building, it's going to take you uh, a couple of days, maybe. Um, we, we, have, uh, we have a wealth of online materials. We've got uh, trial versions of the software. We've got training courses. We've got a lot of ways to, um, to help you learn. Um, but it's going to take you a couple of days, probably, because it's a wholly different paradigm, even though uh, we're, we're, we're working with data in a tabular way, similar to Excel, and we actually can input and output to Excel, the way that you deal with data sets, the, the concepts of joining data and everything, that, that's going to take a little bit of uh, acclimation, but, but not very long. If you're uh, a more technical user, if you know your way around databases, um, or uh, heaven forbid if you're a, a software developer, then uh, it's, it's going to take you a couple hours um, to, uh, to see this technology, to work with a couple of examples, and to be, uh, to be right off to the races. I mean, as I said before, we're really we're targeting the business analyst here. So the barriers, the skill barrier to effectively working with data, we want to make as low as possible. Um, another thing that I'd mention is that um, as much as we want to approach the, the business analyst and, and foster that converse, collaboration between the business analyst and the IT user, we also want to foster the communication between the business analyst and their boss and the CFO um, who is used to looking at pie charts and KPIs but not used to getting his hands dirty maybe with the data sets themselves. It may be the case, it is often the case, that the business analyst who's sitting down building this application can be sitting right next to the CFO explaining this application to them as I've done to you. Uh, it would take me a, a few more minutes really to take you left to right here and you'd have a thorough understanding of the different business rules in this application uh, when, when you showed up an hour ago and, and had never seen it before. So we, um, it, it takes a short time to learn and we really want to allow more people to learn different aspects of its application. Last question. I've got two minutes left here. Um, there's a question. Oh, somebody's been on our website. Um, they're uh, they're asking what features are not available in the public version of our software. Um, we we have a few different versions of our software. Uh, I work here, so I've got the the full blown do anything you want version. Um, the public version is a sort of feature paired back version of our software, which still gives you all of the um, the visual tableau that you're seeing here and. Uh, a lot of the functionality that I've described, in fact, most of the functionality that I've shown you. Um, however, the set of these nodes that I'm cycling through here is going to be lower. Um, we're not, we don't give all of the nodes away with the technology. And the size of data sets that you're going to be working with is going to be constrained. You can only work with 100,000 rows of data versus a, a, here you're seeing me work in my uh, in my small data set on my paltry laptop, but this same solution really scales up to to hundreds of millions or billions of records when you put it in a production environment. Um, but the public version is uh, is just constrained to a hundred thousand. Um, but I'd encourage anybody to go out there and get it because most of the piece parts of this technology, and certainly the, the parts that are applicable to the conversation that we're trying to broker, they're available to you now. So that said. 
Um, we're, we're at the end of our time. Uh, thank you very much for participating, and thank you for your questions. And um, I'll just uh, I'll hand it back to Ben and uh, thank Ben again, Modern Analyst, for facilitating. Thank you, Mark, for a very informative presentation. Thank you, everyone, for attending today's Modern Analyst webinar. I wanted to point out that the webinar, along with the slides, will be archived at modernanalyst.com within a few days. This concludes today's event, and we hope you have a great day.